an engineer with the space shuttle program. I work with a Boeing subcontractor. We all work in the same building and do the same stuff, but it's a hierarchy of how contracts are awarded and the way the government space program works. So I don't work directly for NASA, but I do work with the space shuttle program. Um, yeah, I made Awakening. Uh, my intent was to, in a way, vent, but vent in a, in a streamlined timeline fashion. Uh, but in 30 minutes or less, that was my target, to try to reach the ADD audience, if mm -hmm. for, for lack of a better term. Because, um, you know, Zeitgeist Addendum is, is a great piece of work, but it can be very long, and, and that will appeal to some people, but it's missing another demographic. And so I wanted to go after the 30-minute demographic. Uh, and uh, that's basically what I put together. Of course, you know, as I'm sure Peter will say the same thing. When you make something like that and throw it out there, you're not expecting it to you know, blow yeah. up yeah. into this big thing. Like I told my father when I made it, I'll be lucky if four people or 40 people, you know, watch this in a week and had like 400 a day for like a month. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm well over 50,000 now and I appreciate all the support. It's been uh, translated and redubbed in multiple languages. It's on dot .sub. Um, it's around the world. It's been burnt to DVDs and handed out in all kinds of places. Uh, I'm very happy that people were able to learn from it and use it because it is a factual, fact-oriented tool. Uh, it covers just historical precedent, where, we, where everything started and where we are now and why we are transitioning, whether we like it or not, into a different social paradigm and just trying to lay out what that is and why it's come to pass. Not that something is good or evil per se, but just here are the facts, here's where we're headed down this path. Um, I made our technical reality as an engineer and a science-minded individual. Uh, I, I am disappointed by the lack of education that people have just for the basic sciences that are out there that exist that they know nothing about because we're more interested in Lindsay Lohan's latest judicial uh, debate than we are about the science, engineering, and technology that comes out to really enhance people's lives but isn't really being used you know, in that particular fashion. So I made our technical reality as a quick push to show people here are just some basic categories. Here's energy, here's transportation, here's food production, different concepts as to the technical solutions that exist right now in today's world that help advocate what the resource-based economy is all about. Um, it's not so much that it's a control mechanism, it's an abundance mechanism. When you increase that abundance mechanism or you enhance that abundance mechanism, you end up inadvertently, corollarily solving other problems along the line. It's more like added benefits than the actual drive. The drive is the efficiency and the abundance creation. That's what the point is. Right. Now, Doug, if you wouldn't mind opening it up with uh, giving your understanding you know, a fairly brief understanding of what a resource-based economy is, why you feel that it is necessary that we make a transition into this type of an economy, and how it relates to scarcity and abundance, and how it covers many of the social problems and in inequalities and in inadequacies that we have currently right now in today's society. All right, I'll try, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Why, do we, why are we going towards a resource-based economy, or why should we go towards a resource-based economy? It's an excellent question. We've been heading that direction all along. Uh, you go back 100,000 years to hunter-gatherer tribes. They lived in natural abundance. In other words, there was a very low population spread out around the planet. They weren't connected to each other. In fact, most of them didn't even know each other existed. Uh, they had relative abundance of food and vegetables and everything around them. They didn't have a high standard of living. You know, get a cut, get a scratch, break a leg, you're having a bad day, you can't go to the hospital. But, you know, they still lived in natural abundance and there was no system of trade because they didn't need to trade for anything. They were self-sufficient in and of themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Then they start getting in contact with other tribes or other, loca other peoples from other parts of the world that, well, you've got something I want but I don't have because you have come from a different geography and vice versa. So what are we going to do? Well, let's come up with a system of trade. So, you know, two cows for a sheep or whatever the case may be. So that evolves and then you start developing proxy systems because that can be cumbersome after a while doing those kinds of trade mechanisms. So then you start to develop 
you know, your proxy systems, your shells or your jewels or your gold or your silver coins, money, etc. And so that's where you get the development of money as a proxy system of trade for inadequacies between systems. I have something you don't have or vice versa or services that can be provided because one person has the capability or the accessibility to learn a particular trade and somebody else doesn't, they learn something else and so now they can work together in that way. Well, let's jump up to today's society where we have massive amounts of communication, open information. You can learn anything you want online. There's really, I can learn astrophysics online if I wanted to. And in fact, you can. There are Stanford lectures uh, from some of the leading astrophysicists in the world that are free online on YouTube for people to go. And there's Caltech and MIT and all kinds of ways you can learn whatever you want. Art, science, engineering, food, made, culinary arts, etc. It can all be found in that particular manner. I do believe that face-to-face -face interaction is, is, a, is an adequate learning tool as well, so not everything should be done online. But the point is, it's there. The information is out there. So self-limitations don't truly exist as far as, oh, I can't go learn something. Yes, you can. You can learn things in different ways. But only for the people who have the kind of technical capability to reach those systems, to get on the internet. Right. Somebody in the middle of Dubai, or in the middle of uh, the Congo, isn't exactly going to have high-speed internet access to reach that kind of education level. And so what the resource-based economy does is take all of our technical innovations that we've developed up to this point, especially automation, which is, is a big crux of the, of the movement in general, and using those in a way to benefit all people and not just those who copyright, maintain, and hold sway over that particular development. And in other words, it's open source, not just open source information, but open source technology and open source access so that everybody can enjoy the benefits of that widget, whatever that widget happens to be. And in the, in the process, using science, engineering, and technology, which has been largely responsible, basically almost all responsible, for the developments of the first world nations to become longer lifespans, more healthy, adequate medical care, transportation, energy systems, etc. That's what has given them a higher quality of life allowing that to filter to everybody else as well. And that's what the resource-based economy is trying to do. Excellent. Now, uh, if you would clarify on the role of government, how the role of government would play with a resource-based economy and um, politics or the political process. Okay. Um, in today's system, and we have kind of put it together in a very authoritarian still setup where even though we have the democracy and people, you know, talk and, and try to work things out to do go through the political process. We put other people in charge to do that. We don't really do it ourselves. We're not a direct democracy in that sense. And, and direct democracies have their own problems as well. You don't want, you know, somebody who doesn't know anything about a particular tub subject just throwing their opinion out on that subject because it has no relevance. Right. You, know, you, uh, you know, no offense, you don't know what you're talking about, so why are you giving your two cents? If you learn about it and educate yourself on it, then that opinion has validity. Everybody may be entitled to their opinion, but that doesn't mean they're right. <laughs> so that's why you start to elect people to help, you know, speak for you. But the people that we've started, the political process has gotten very convoluted when you start looking at the corporate influence, we start looking at the monetary influence, and you start looking at, it's blatantly obvious that politicians are more interested in the next election cycle than they are actually solving problems, not just for today's generation or for themselves. They don't look five, six, seven generations down the line and really do a true analysis to see how is this decision going to affect a multiple of of variables. Uh, the scientific method for social concern is the process by which you break things down for longer term purposes and you look at you know, long term effects. And so the political system would be different in that some of the decisions that are made today, for example, are like band-aids over deeper underlying problems. And the underlying problems could be solved without legislation, but with technical implementation. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that, John, you were talking about earlier was uh, the vampire with the cops taking blood because of drunk drivers. And then you were talking about the ways to fix the drunk driver issue. If I had a car that had a radar system built into it and can drive itself, and Germany has one and Stanford has developed automated cars, you can just hop in and say, take me home, and the car will take you home. And it will not, without question, will not crash into any other vehicle because all the vehicles are going to be able to 
do what's called live active algorithmic adjusting, which is 100,000 times a second, they could communicate to each other and know within fractions of an inch where they are on the freeway and wh with respect to other vehicles and get you home via GPS and all the other technologies we have. So we don't need legislation to solve that problem. We need a car that can get us